Hi folks, we're going to do two things in this video. We're going to walk through someone else's cam for how they've machined and programmed this part just to see if we've got anything that we would do differently or perhaps improve or think about if we were moving into higher volume production. And the second thing we're going to do is tackle a way to chamfer that inside edge. So let's dive in. Now I'm doing this real time. I haven't looked at the part ahead of time. And by no means is this a comparison about who's a better programmer, but rather just a second set of eyes to answer that age old question of, hmm, I wonder if somebody else would do this differently. On that note, there's a big difference if you're programming something for speed just to get a one or a few of them made or for production. And there's actually a hybrid model where you get a part going, you start making it, whether it's one or just even the roughing strategy of one, get them spindles turning, get things going, and then come back and fix and refine. So the first thing I'll do when I look at someone else's part is the major operation. So first we're holding it with Versa grips, op one. Second is op two. We flipped it over. And then the third op is this side hole. So first question is, can we get rid of an operation? And in this case, assuming that we stick to just a three axis machine, the answer is generally going to be no with one caveat. There are right angle heads that are macing that can be used on vertical machining centers and can even be tool changed. However, they're not inexpensive. They're not super common, uh, certainly not as common as fourth and even fifth axis work is these days. But if you've got a part where all of the work happens in the first two operations and there's just one feature that would require that third operation, it's worth considering. We also hacked our Tormach post to put a Bridgeport 90 degree head on a Tormach a while back. And so not a good use here, but it's one of those nuggets that you should put in the back of your head because there could be a situation where something like that could really help you. The other thing I've got under my preferences is manufacturer. I have show operation machining time turned on. That gives me the time stamp on each operation. And what I want to do is right click on the overall setup to look at the machining time. So we've got six minutes and 15 seconds, four minutes and 15 seconds. So 10 minutes and 30 seconds total plus one minute and 10 seconds. So let's jot that down. Even if these aren't perfect representations of the actual machining time, they'll serve as a great comparison for some of the changes that we're going to make. So if we can't get rid of a whole setup, the next thing I'll look for is ways to either get rid of individual cam operations or consolidate tools, uh, which can mean fewer tools, fewer setups, fewer tool changes, etc. So let's run a simulation though and see what this process kind of looks like. So we're decking off the top of this part, doing a roll in, roll around the part, spotting, we're going to talk about that in a second. Okay, form tapping, okay, opening that hole up. Adaptive, come around, OD. Just chamfers, okay, chamfers, graving, and then a final pass, okay, great. So let's talk about this spot drilling. We generally don't need a spot drill anymore. If we go pull up a drill on McMaster, say 228, which is a drill size for a form tap, any of these that have a split point style here do not require a pilot hole, but I want a short length version and general purpose. Shorter means it's going to be stiffer. I don't need to pilot or spot this. It's a 135 degree split point. That would be a high speed steel version. You could also step up to a carbide version if you've got a machine that's able to do it. You can also step up to a through spindle coolant version if your machine has that capability. Either way, one of the first things I would do is get rid of that spot drill, which eliminates a whole operation and a tool change. On the drilling there, I don't know why they're drilling so deep. We'll come back though to see what, how that gets handled in the second op. Form tapping. So there's more that we can come back to on each one of these operations of nitpicky, like lead in, lead outs, uh, linking move, feed rates, etc. But let's just tackle the low hanging fruit first. So we've got the form tapping done, and then we're doing a 2D adaptive. So one of the things that jumps out to me is that this is the longest single operation on this part. The other thing is that we've already had a drill in the machine ready to go poking holes in this part. So I'm going to right click, edit, hold down the control key, and if I click this, I should be able to click. Ah, we've got a hole mode as diameter. That's actually a great way to use the uh, drill wizard. Control D to duplicate it, and a second operation, Click that, 
click OK. And we've now got additional drill in the middle there. And then on our adaptive, that is a quarter inch tool. So I'm going to want to keep a ramping move because the end mill that we're using is larger than that pre-drill. But that pre-drill will help minimize the amount of cutting that has to happen on the ramp in. So we can increase the helix angle from say two to six and we're going to do a ramp taper angle start with five degrees and we'll see what this looks like so now it's going to shave that time percentage wise quite a bit and let's run a simulation to see how we're doing once you get to know a machine or a tool or material you can actually get a pretty decent feel for how this is going to perform even though it's just a graphical simulation so that's probably a little bit too much if you see how it's tapering down and part of that's because the diameter that we're ramping in is quite a bit larger switch over to the flute only here on the uh, preview it's quite a bit larger than that pre-drill hole so two different ways we could tackle this back down the ramp taper angle a little bit and actually to tighten up that helical ramp diameter let's say we'll go to 0.15 which is going to make that those red circles smaller which is going to keep them closer to the diameter of that pre-drill. That looks better. Okay, finishes that up. 2D contour to clean that up. And then the adaptive to come around it. So the beauty of adaptive, which I absolutely love as a toolpath, has a lot more to do with diving into corners. On a simple part like this, where we know we're starting with a known round diameter and we're just walking around the outside, I would probably ditch that adaptive and let me look at how much stock we've got first off if you could possibly buy smaller diameter stock that could help a lot 2.5 and what's our part 2.24 so it's a question whether you can get 2.25 inch uh, round bar and if that's close enough for the task at hand obviously that would be a huge time savings regardless what I'm going to propose and this is up to the customer if they want to do this or not is to delete this adaptive and on this 2D contour, most modern machining centers cutting out, and I believe this is an aluminum part, uh, are going to really have no problem handling a couple of roughing passes. We'll say 0 0.05 to You've got great chip evacuation. Nothing should be blocking that or causing that tool to clog up. It's not going to be presented with any surprised amount of load. Uh, I suspect you'll be fine here. The last thing though I want to look at is there's not a lot of overlap on that finishing pass. The way that lead and lead out happens, it looks like they're using cutter comp or wear comp. No, I'm wrong. I, but I would like to do a finishing overlap. So what this will do is it will cause the toolpath to go slightly beyond the starting point just to make sure you minimize any mark you may see from when the tool immediately engages that part. And you can see now there's that extra distance right there. Again, that can help blend lines, especially on a part like this where you don't have a good corner to pick where you could kind of hide any blend line or linking move. Next up, chamfering. So not going to necessarily be a ton we can do here. If I really wanted to crank the speed on this part, you'd want to weigh the speed of a tool change compared to the fact that you are contouring or surfacing, basically walking around all of these other circles, which could be handled by a single plunge of a properly sized uh, 90 degree chamfer tool, which could, that same tool could possibly also be used for uh, the profiling around it. The other thing you could do if you really want to crank speed is you could get a custom drill made, not as expensive as you might think, and that same drill, when it's drilling these through holes, could also add the chamfer, and that will be significantly faster because you don't have to re-drill these holes for the chamfer. Uh, you'll still need the chamfer tool, though, to machine the other chamfers, but that would be a big time savings. One of the other low-hanging fruits I've found on these tools is getting a multi-flute. So this is a Lakeshore 4-flute. They make some 4, 5, or 6-fluters. I don't think there's necessarily a ton of low-hanging fruit here. One thing that you could do, though, is just increase the feed rate. Yeah, this is the one that I would recommend as the has the helix angle on it. Uh, so we love these. They're great. The issue here is you've just got a lot of distance to run over because the way you're programming all of these 
that's probably the max RPM on this machine, 10,000 RPMs. You could probably increase the feed per tooth to go faster, but you will see some form of scalloping with that. Uh, so it's a question of if that's acceptable for the condition and aesthetic that the end part should look like. Engraving, and then I love this trick, a quick final face. That can really help knock off any slight burrs that may have happened. It's very common with uh, the engraving. I'm going to guess that this is done at like half a thousand stock to leave. It's not. It's kissing it right over the top. Usually when I do this I will have a stock to leave and I'll put a value in here of 0 0.5. So half a thousandth of an inch or about 0 0.01 millimeters. Let's take a look at the second operation. Simulate. I'll click on that first adaptive. So this is what we were left with. Anytime you've got an inverted top hat like this, you want to machine that material away before you deck it, which is what we're about to do with this face mill. Otherwise, it can tear off, which can ruin a tool or rip the part out of the vise. Not a lot of low-hanging fruit here, other than it looks like there's a little bit of air, maybe some air cutting in the beginning, which the customer can fix if that's the case. I don't want to change that without them confirming that. And then on the facing operation, we're taking three depths of cut, which I hate to do, and we're running at a relatively low RPM, now pretty heavy feed rate, 10 thousandths of an inch feed per tooth. But the problem is that this is a two and a half inch five insert face mill. Let's just do a quick comparison of what the time would be if we say use a three eighth inch standard end mill. 3D adaptive clearing. Probably have to make a new tool, which is not something I take lightly. Well, in fact, so that we avoid having a new tool, let's see how quickly we could do it with a quarter inch end mill. I believe this is being machined on a Sharp, which is a import grade VMC, but nevertheless very capable and should have no problem with a feed per tooth of 3 thousandths of an inch in aluminum. Let's see what we get. Probably need to do some adjustment on the planes. So we'll change the heights from the stock top to model top, which should just have it clean up that top area. Change the stock selections to be so I would probably ditch the 52 second face mill in lieu of a 43 second adaptive. It saves a tool change because we had this adaptive clean up the outside. You could actually merge these together, although he's cutting this one slightly lower than this plane here. And adaptive often leaves an acceptable floor finish. So I'd set the axial stock to leave at zero. Now that is the one caveat here is if they want a fly finish or face mill style finish, then we'd need to revisit a face mill application here, but my guess is we could probably push this even harder than 3,007 inch feet per tooth or perhaps slightly increase the optimal load because it's such an open feature if we really want to shave a little bit more time off of that. And now that I'm seeing that we've got the same backside chamfer of all these holes, uh, we're going to come back in a second and do a comparison of how quickly we could do those if we, we switch this to a 3 8 inch tool that would allow us to plunge drill all these chamfers and that same tool could handle all the surfaced chamfers as well. Contour cleanup for the chamfer there. Another bit of uh, looks like a engraving the logo. And a last face. Yeah, so we're going to come in with that face mill anyways to clean up that engraving and any other little bit of burr. So we definitely want to do uh, this adaptive mix in the beginning here. And so let's switch out this tool, or duplicate it rather, as a 3 8 inch. So right click, duplicate tool. I'm just going to call it 44 so that it's clear. It's the new one. And we'll say 3 8 Super easy to program. Okay. Let's look at our feed rates. So we can plunge this at probably 7,000 feet per rev, retract at 100. And then we can change this contour. So we've got 16. We can delete everything except this inside. And we'll change this to tool 44. The larger diameter tool, all else equals, is also going to handle this larger chamfer width better. Click OK. And not totally clear why this one would have to be a separate operation, but believe we can just 
consolidate these into one by holding down the control key, choosing that outside edge. We have a chamfer tip offset. You can increase that a little bit. And the last thing is make sure we have a finishing overlap of 50 thousandths of an inch or some value. And in fact, I right click and make default. It's more common that I want it in there, so I remove it if and when I don't. So we've merged these two. And if we compare that to the tool four here, 53 seconds compared to 51 seconds, that's not a win. Uh, that is disappointing. So let's just look and see if there's a way that I can redeem myself on this. And the heights on the retract planes are a bit generous right now. So let's see, top heights, whole top. Feed height could be the top height uh, plus 50 thousandths of an inch. Retract height could be feed height plus 0.1 inches. And the clearance height could be the retract height of 0.2 inches. 18 seconds plus 30 seconds, that's not bad. Still not as much savings as I had expected, to be honest. Again, we could start going at a higher feed per tooth, but that would be cheating because, again, you're going to sacrifice some surface finish and appearance. We, from memory, do run this tool a little bit faster than this with great results, but that's not really the point of this exercise. And engraving. Engraving can be difficult because it does require relatively low feed per tooth and exactly where it, all the RPMs we've got 10,000, only half a thou feed per tooth. The only thing that I would add to this product as a potential way to really save that would be to look at picking up something like the Tormach Diamond Drag Engraver. Some folks don't like it. One of the things it does tend to do is raise a burr. It actually looks great the way the diamond scores aluminum. And this is a Tormach tool, but it could be used in any machining center. Uh, or any CNC machine. But since we're already coming back in with a face mill in this application to clean up the face of that part, I would say this could be a great option and you can run this at a very fast feed rate. You say 100 inches per minute, the tool basically never wears out. And on this last face, four thousandths of an inch, you could probably come in a little bit faster. You're not gonna save a ton of time, but you're really only coming in to clean up, again, any burr. I don't really wanna recut. Although here, because we said we may want that finish, you may want to do the keep the controlled feed rate of four thousandths of an inch. And finally, okay, T1, is that the same? So again, I would get rid of the spot drill. Now, on a curved surface, spot drills could become more important, but it's a relatively gentle slope. We're going to use that short length split point drill, so shouldn't be a need for that. Uh, I would think this should be a peck and retract. No, they're just doing that in one plunge. It's a 0.22, is that the same? Looks like the same tool, which is great. Yep, 228 drill. And how deep are we going? Sometimes this can be tricky to measure in Fusion Saw to pick a point here and just the bottom of that arc, which will give us a general distance. So only two times depth. So I probably would have pecked that by default, but if uh, he is able to do it in one fell soup, that is great. There's another type of drill that's worth mentioning if you need to drill deep holes without something like through spindle coolant. And there are these carbide parabolic drills from McMaster. Uh, others probably sell them, but I've found them through McMaster. And they're a little tricky to find. So the way I've done it is I go to drill and I add a filter of a 150 degree point and see if they come up. Just pick a random size here so that we can 228. There are three flutes. Yep, these are it. Three cutting edges instead of the two, and able to drill with a smoother finish. Split point, so it keeps the center without a pilot hole. They're not inexpensive, but I have found these to be a good solution when you're looking for a little bit more of a faster or production-oriented drill. Again, especially if you don't have through spindle coolant on your machine. If you have through spindle coolant, it is absolutely amazing and something that you should use. Quick chamfer. I'm gonna take a longer look offline here to see if there's any other improvements I see. Uh, and then finally, what we've got to do is tackle the toolpath to use a backside chamfering tool for this inside or underside curved chamfer. Let's take a quick look and see if we saved enough time to be happy with the end result. So 543, 322. Where you really save times is avoiding the tool changes. Fusion allows you to set up your tool change time. I have found that it tends to be more substantial than Fusion always shows, and perhaps that's just because I've not played with all of the settings, but when you can avoid the need for the machine to move to a tool change location and to pull, rotate the carousel or the umbrella, 
and change a tool and go back. That's where you can really shave time off. But we did save some time. We took an approximately 11 minute and 40 second tool path down to 10 minutes, which is a minute and 40, which is pretty decent. That's about 10%. That's absolutely an amount of time that can add up. The next best way to improve this would be to look at some sort of a pallet or bulk way to run these. I would not run them out of round bar. I would run them out of square bar. In fact, that could be a great second video. Comment below if you guys want us to go down that path. But I'd probably buy these in strips, load them into a fixture with pit bulls and talons and be able to make say eight at a time in op one and flip them into an op two style thing that could be a huge productivity boon because you're also then minimizing or rather spreading your tool changes across say eight parts or 12 parts coming back for a closer look through these i'll start with the longest operation in this case it's the drill and the one thing that does jump out at me is we're drilling all the way through for really no reason especially because we're coming through with an end mill on the back side. In fact, you could argue you're better off not drilling through it because drilling through that's going to change the tool pressure as it's coming over this back side to clean off that face. So I'm going to change these through holes from stock bottom to model bottom. Drill tip through with 10 thou. That's fine. I'll leave that. That takes it from 58 seconds to 50 seconds. Only 8 seconds, but again, from a percentage standpoint, fairly decent. We don't want to make a change here because that is a pre-drill for the adaptive. We want, we want to remove the material there. Form tapping, the only way it will save time is a higher RPM. This is at 800. I would have no hesitation to try about 1,000 RPMs on that, but some machines just can't accelerate that quickly in such a short hole. So this is an example where it may say it's faster, but in the reality, it may not uh, be going any faster. Now this jumps out at me. This is wasted motion. We have already faced this part off, so we have no material above the model top. So why is it cutting air for this distance right here? That's a quick fix. We can solve it by model top with no offset. And under the linking tab, it's a silly setting. That's the default of a 0.1 inch ramp clearance height, which 0.1 inches is a mile. I would change that to 10 thousandths of an inch only 40 seconds so not a huge savings there however when you're running this parts and you see it cutting air you can't help but think that you didn't put your best foot forward in the cam programming we have a very strange lead in on this which i want to take a look at i misspoke earlier that strange lead in is due to cutter comp so in control i was having a brain lapse is using uh, compensation at the CNC machine to adjust diameters. So that tells me this is a critical diameter. So the one thing you could do to shave some time off, we have repeat finishing passes checked. Now I love this feature because it causes the tool to take a spring pass to walk around that again and you'll find that that does really help mitigate deflection. Then there's always deflection. I challenge you to go do a test where you take a light cut on a piece of aluminum with an end mill, put a sharpie line on it, run the same program again, and you'll find that it machines that sharpie mark and some aluminum away. But obviously if you keep doing that, you'll eventually have taken any amount of deflection or tool pressure out of the equation. So doing repeat spring pass a repeat finishing pass to take one spring pass is a great way to not worry about that as much. However, it comes at the expense of doubling uh, effectively your tool path. So if you know what this cut's going to be, what you can do is uncheck that and you may have to do a radial sock to leave of say negative 0 0.0005, half a thousand. Now I'm making that number up, maybe a little bit more, but uh, you're going to basically cheat and build in that deflection into that single tool path so that you don't have to waste time cutting it again. The other thing we can do on the adaptive is leave less stock. So rather than leave 10 thousandths of an inch, we'll say leave 4 thousandths of an inch. We've got a really small tolerance and a really small smoothing value, which is important so that the tessellated model that's using the adaptive doesn't violate uh, and gouge. Generally wouldn't happen on a circular feature like this anyways, but I uh, want to keep those tolerances low and then you could potentially get rid of that spring pass. Some people would say it's not worth it. You get so much better process reliability from the time of that secondary spring pass. Other options here are, are kind of outside the spirit of this video. You know, using larger diameter tools to take this in fewer passes is something that you could do, but again, isn't, isn't the goal. I was really surprised. I thought we would get a more bang for our buck out of the uh, drilling, and I will, if we do another one of these videos, um, which I think we will, I'll follow back up with this part in the customer to see. I suspect you might get more savings than is being shown in the time simulation here. 
if we ran a strip of these, uh, again, if we do that video uh, of diving into it, it, you could use the face mill to walk across, say, say, six of these at a time, which will be another way that you gain savings. And it's a different way of thinking about the fusion programming because you've got a lot of individual part operations, and then you've got these others that are kind of uh, multi-part, single tool or single cam operations that's a fun way to program and think about. Um, so I think that's probably about it. Let me finish up this, uh, take a look at this chamfer here, and I'll be right back. The customer already owns this Harvey Specialty Profile back deburring end mill. So I Googled, because I know Harvey has some libraries available for download, and I'm hoping that this Specialty Profile one has that tool already in it. So let's download that. I'll expand my data panel. I'll go to my data panel cloud folder. That's actually under assets, cam tools, and upload. And I'll pick that file. While that's uploading, there's another tool I wanted to share that, because it's just so cool. It is a deburring tool from Cogsdill. Awesome if you're doing any sort of volume production because it's able to take this spring-loaded deburring edge and collapse into the tube so you can chamfer both the top and the back side of a hole in one stroke as you're coming through. Okay, with that open, we should be able to now search for that part number in the tool library. Specialty profiles. Perfect. The other way we could have done this was create our own form tool by downloading the DXF, but it's much easier to do it this way. There's two ways we could handle this. And first off, there's not a CAD model chamfer, so I believe the point here is simply to uh, create an edge break chamfer versus, say, the larger chamfers here that uh, are not only edge break chamfers, but also play into the cosmetic role and poten potentially the functionality of the part. So we don't need much of a chamfer. The two ways that I can think of would be one option from the 2D menu, which would be 2D contour, or in the 3D menu we could do something like potentially a 3D contour, which is the only tool path that can do occluded view surfacing. So it can actually see a surface that you can't see straight down from the top because it's occluded or blocked, and it can create tool paths around that. We actually did a whole video on 3D contour for occluded surfaces with things like lollipop end mills or tools like this, but 2D contour is going to be easier if I can get it to work. Once we pick the tool uh, from the profile here and add it to a cam operation in this part, it'll move into the tool library for this specific file. And we've got the orientation set because we're now in the correct third operation. So geometry, if I pick this, so that's right, that's going to be the problem, is that you can't do a 2D contour for a curved surface. You can, however, do trace. So let's try trace. Now that tool should be in our balancing ring file now because I used it once. Here we go, yeah, tool number five. Click select, trace, click that. So let's just see what we get. Anytime I get a height error, I make sure the heights are all stacked. So Feed height would be model top plus 50 thousandths of an inch. Okay, so that's actually a, a quirk. Why is the feed height, say if I adjust this, why is it that green arrow all the way at the top? Okay, there's something in the model that makes it think that it's way too high up. So I'm going to change this to selection. I'll pick that there. Now the green is the bottom height. Stock top is, or excuse me, the retract height is point two inches from the feed height and then retract height from there click OK. Good news is we have a toolpath needs tweaked uh, what I don't like is the form tool doesn't look right now this may be a bug if we open up and edit the tool it, we can see it is visually correct here so I'm not going to worry about this right now because the much more valuable thing is to get the toolpath to do what I want I'm going to assume that the section here is just somehow incorrectly shown in this preview as too wide because I believe the section of the tool that we want to do the cutting with is this tapered section right here. So bear with me, I'm going to basically ignore that. If we simulate this toolpath though, a couple problems that we need to adjust. It's plunging in off to the side, which would gouge the part or crack ruin the tool. And then it needs to cut lower, or the more accurate way to describe that is the blue line relates to the control point of the tool, which is probably the outside edge. In fact, form tools, you can define the control point. I don't think you can modify it in Fusion, though. 
control point is the bottom center. So we need to do some offsetting. Uh, and this is common with trace because trace is not by default set to compensate one way or the other. But what we can do is add it to left-handed comp and I don't know what we need to do. Let's add a little bit of a lead in here and see what we get. I'm looking better. Okay, we'll have to adjust that lead in for sure, but that's easy to fix after we get the toolpath to, to do what I want. I'm going to turn the stock off. It'll run simulation quicker. Looks like that. Okay, good. What you can see is we do have some three-dimensional nature to this. It's a little bit tricky to see, so a couple things we can do. The easiest way to improve that is to add a section analysis, click that plane, drag it back a little ways. It doesn't really matter how much. It's so whatever works for the task at hand. And we can now simulate that. So I need to know what this distance is. I don't think the Harvey tool gives that to us. We could open up the DXF and do this more scientifically, but the reality is I've every time I've done this, I usually just brute force it with some plug and chug. So let's push stock to leave. We're going to go down, say negative 20 thou. Let's see how that changes it. And in simulation, I'm just going to click on the toolpath to start to see where that is. So that got me less than half of what I want. So let's go to 60 thou. And then we're going to do negative radials as well. That's what's going to be what actually creates the chamfer. So we're now we're starting to get somewhere. Okay, we need to go a little bit more negative in axial and less in radial. Okay, so now. Now you can see we're not cutting at all. We've gone too far, but that's great because that tells us we're zeroing in on, on where we need to be. And in fact, I like this because you can see when it's furthest to the left, that means that if we lift this tool up now, so less negative axial stock to leave, that's going to start cutting the chamfer on the relatively wider section of this tool, which I like. So let's bring that up. small change, 10 thousandths of an inch, you know, two or three sheets of printer paper was all we needed there to do that. Close that. Let's turn off our section view and let's simulate that again. Yeah, that looks good. There's a really cool trick we can do in simulation to show exactly how much chamfer we're actually cutting. I'll go to the main setup, simulate, turn off our model visibility. So we've got stock on, we're in comparison mode. I'll start with a tolerance of say five thousandths of an inch and I'm gonna go to the end of the toolpath. So simulate everything and everything is green which means subject to the five thousandths of an inch tolerance. Green means we are within tolerance, red means we're gouging. What we can do, and we actually see that chamfer there, the question is though kind of how big is it? So if we start lowering this tolerance value, as things start to appear red we'll know kind of what their value is. So at, f at four, we actually start to see some amount, which is starting to tell me that this is maybe about a four thousandths of an inch chamfer. Three, now we really start to see it. Two, now there's some limitations to this, including the graphics and fusion and the tessellation and so forth. So this is not perfect, but that gives me some idea that maybe it's about a three or four thou edge break chamfer. So again, if you want to see more videos taking a second set of eyes on other Fusion users' parts, or you want to see us take this part and kind of build out a production fixture workflow for it, let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, folks, hope you learned, hope you enjoyed. Take care. See you soon.